yeah. So it's this is a rerun for Pastor David, but not for everybody else, right? Well, my name is Scott Keen, as David said, and uh, my wife April and I have been missionaries with Ethnos since 2002, 2003. Uh, we served really pretty much all of our time at, at uh, Ethnos 360 Bible Institute in Jackson, Michigan, uh, which is where I met uh, you know uh, Wes and Rebecca, and so had the privilege of knowing them. And I currently serve remotely uh, from Texas and oversee our online program. And, and David has been helping us out with that for a number of years now, overseeing classes for us, which is a huge help. So we appreciate that ministry. And just appreciate what you all are doing here. Honestly, if I lived close, I think I'd be coming to church here. I can already just sense a real joy. Everybody's friendly and excitement about the Lord. So thank you for what you're doing here. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny. When you, when you speak somewhere one time, you just kind of parachute in. You pick a text and you do it. Uh, when I do like Bible conferences and things like that, I try to pick a book and just stick with it. But, uh, you know, we, we, get one, we get one session here. And so I decided the resurrection would be encouraging because how could you not be encouraged with the resurrection of Jesus? And so I'm calling this steadfast and immovable. That comes from the final verse of this chapter where after Paul reminds them of the resurrection of Jesus and what that means, he says, Therefore, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And one of the things that's been on my mind lately, uh, and maybe you felt the same way, is that uh, in, in our Christian walk, you know, we realize, first of all, that our faith puts us at odds with the world. And of course, we have a posture of reaching out to the world, but the world is not friendly to our faith. And also we see, you know, as, as political currents are in a turmoil and the world scene is in turmoil, it reminds you to back up and think about what is it that I know that is an anchor that doesn't change. And that's that firm foundation of the Word of God, the reality of who Jesus is and what He's accomplished. And that is an anchoring point. It's a mooring point. It's like a compass for us, and it sets the pathway. And so I, my prayer this morning is that the Lord would encourage us just to be strong and resilient in our faith, knowing in whom we have believed and, and continue to trust Him no matter what comes. Uh, now that's serious, and I'm going to go from serious to not serious for just a second on this next slide here. And uh, so I'm a dad, a dad of three. April and I have, uh, our, our son is 19. He's now a blacksmith and a leather worker. He has his own business. Uh, April homeschools the girls. Madison, who will be 16 in a few weeks, and Sadie, who will be 14 in July. And uh, over the years, one of the things that we've done a lot of is read books to our kids. And, you know, April does the serious homeschool books and I do Dr. Seuss <laughs> and Bible stories and things like that. And uh, I, I love this story about Horton the Elephant. And so I, this is for a purpose, not just to tell a dad story. So if you know about Horton the Elephant, uh, he, he's visiting or walking through the jungle. And there's this crazy bird, Maisie, that wants to go on a vacation. And she's sitting on a nest and she sees Horton coming. And she's like, hey, will you watch this egg for me? Well, I'll be right back, I promise. And she takes off, has no intentions on coming back. And Horton the elephant sits on that nest. Uh, he sits there through frigid temperatures, through bitter cold. He sits there through thunder and lightning. He sits there through ridicule as people make fun of him for sitting on a nest. They put the tree on a boat and they go across the oceans. And still he remains on that tree and even at gunpoint. He looked at the hunters as much as to say, shoot if you must, but I won't run away. And what is it for us that would give us that grit, that Holy Spirit conviction that say what you will and even do what you must, but I am not going to compromise my faith in Christ and I'm not going to be shaken in my faith in Him. Well, that thing that holds us there is called the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. Kind of the top left corner of the screen, this is Corinth. This is Paul's second missionary journey. 
Paul goes there in his second journey and he preaches the gospel first in a synagogue. Uh, and then after he has resistance from the Jews, he moves next door to someone's home. And Paul remains there for a period of about 18 months, plants a church in Corinth. And the Corinthians were growing as believers, but they were enamored with the philosophers who they saw as the educated elite. And these people came in and they were challenging Paul's authority, challenging Paul's wisdom. And so, for example, in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds them that, that the power of the gospel does not rest in the wisdom of man, but it's in the truth of God's word. And so he has to challenge that. One of the teachings that it seems to be that was influencing the church was a teaching that denied the resurrection. Now, the, the, the Roman and the Greek world, if you'll remember reading Acts 17, when Paul is in Athens, which is very close to Greece and, or to, to Corinth here, uh, in Athens, when Paul preached the resurrection, some people started laughing at him. Because to some people, the thought of like a bodily resurrection was detestable. They, they wanted to die to be free from corruption and, and to pass on from pain to, to something better. And so some people denied the resurrection outright uh, in the sense that there is no afterlife and there is no resurrection. Other people would say that there's an afterlife, but there's not a bodily resurrection. And it seems that this teaching was influencing the church in Corinth. And so Paul wants to bring them back to ground zero, to this anchor of our faith and the simplicity and yet the profundity of the doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. You can go to the next slide. And, and this is kind of where we're going. This is the roadmap before you click, you know, the button to drive on your phone app there. We're looking at the resurrection of Christ as essential for our salvation and also the resurrection of Christ as central to the gospel message. And so that's what we're going to be doing. You can, you can click on to the next slide here. Uh, and I'll read this to you in verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, and which you also stand, by which you're also saved. Look at the, the, the line of thought here. This is what I preached. It's what you received. It's what you're standing in. And this is what you're saved in. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, and then he says, unless you have believed in vain. Now, Paul doesn't think that they have believed in vain. He's not trying to cast doubt on them, but here's where he's going with this. Some people were saying there is no resurrection. And so Paul's saying, time out. This is the message that I preached, the message that you believe, the message that you're standing in, but it's really all in vain if there is no resurrection because Paul preached a resurrection from the dead. And so he's coming back to that centrality. Verse 3. I deliver to you as of first importance. This is preeminent. This is priority. And by the way, uh, you know that there are many doctrines uh, within the, the circle of conservative evangelical Christianity where people disagree on certain things. A, a lot about end times and, and other doctrines that we can get into where, where people argue about. But central to Christianity, there are certain core doctrines that, that it's like an irreducible minimum. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. We believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again, conquering death. That is central to our Christian faith. You can't have Christianity and not have the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus. And so it's central to our faith. And, and what Paul does here, I want to, to emphasize this first. He says that Christ died for our sins, verse 3, according to the Scriptures. And I'll get to some of that, but I just want to start with that Christ died. This is a reality. Now, this is a big deal. I'm kind of laying a foundation here because to say that He resurrected means nothing if He wasn't really dead. We would all agree with that, right? If He was not really dead, then He's not really resurrected. And so you have the reality of His death. Now, uh, there was a doctrine that was going around as, you know, later on that some would claim that this was like not really dead, but He appeared to be dead. 
that He was on the cross for those hours and His body was in a weakened condition and He had lost blood and bodily fluids. And so maybe He just was like looking dead, but He wasn't really dead. And so I asked this last hour, I'll ask it again. Any Princess Bride fans? you seen the movie? Okay, you can appreciate this. <laughs> There's a difference between dead and mostly dead. Because mostly dead is partly alive. Okay? <laughs> but Jesus was not just mostly dead. He was all the way dead. He was all the way dead. Uh, another example here. Uh, years ago, I looked out the window. The dogs were barking. And I could see just on the other side of the invisible fence, the, the, the dogs were like right there at it, and there's a possum laying there. And I thought, wow, the dogs have killed a possum. I wondered how they got across the invisible fence, but, you know, they'd, be, they'd take the shock for a possum any day. And so, and so I see it, and I go out there, and I have a shovel, and I just take the shovel, and I kind of poke the possum and it's doing this, like, yeah, it's, it's dead. And I thought, well, it's late at night, I'll kennel the dogs and I'll bury the possum in the morning. In the morning, there was no possum. <laughs> and it wasn't a resurrection, but it was playing possum, right? <laughs> so so you got to see, like, is this thing dead or not? Because there is no resurrection if there is no death. Now, I want to start with Scripture here. When you read John chapter 19, for example, Jesus breathed His last and gave up His spirit. So the text says that He was dead. Joseph of Arimathea allowed Jesus and desired Jesus to be buried in his tomb. So when you bury someone, you're convinced that they're dead. Um, you know, you can look at, um, at how the soldiers came and they were going to break Jesus' leg because on a cross, if they could raise themselves up, they could get a breath full of air and then they'd collapse again. And so the, when they crucified someone, they would break their leg eventually to hasten their death. If they can't stand up on the cross and get a good lung full of breath, then they're going to die quicker. When they come to Jesus, they do not break His leg because He's already dead. And so he was dead. But, you know, some people are going to say, well, okay, the Bible says he was dead, but was he really dead? So let's go outside the Bible for just a few minutes. Let's look at our next slide here. Uh, this is Josephus, who was a Jewish historian that ended up being pro-Roman because that was the thing to do when they started conquering everybody. And he said this, he said, When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, etc. But noting, outside of Scripture, Josephus recognized and affirmed Jesus was condemned to the cross. Let's go to the next slide. Another example here. Uh, Marah Ber Serapion, 1st to 3rd century. He's, he's a little bit hard to date here. Uh, he talks about how the Jews, by the murder of their wise king, seeing from that very time their kingdom was driven from them. And, and what he means by that is shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus, the Romans conquered Jerusalem 70 AD, and that was the end of things as they knew it. But, but the important part here, he's talking about the murder of their wise king. So Scripture is not the only place that says he was dead. Outside of Scripture, you find historical references, and they're not Christian. They have no agenda to affirm the faith. They're recording history, and they incidentally cover this while they're looking at other things. Next slide, please. Uh, Tacitus, another first century historian. He says, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, or Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And so again, outside of Scripture, someone recognizing that Jesus suffered the supreme penalty, death on a cross, under Pilate. And then one more slide. Lucian of Samosata, he says, The Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage uh, who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. So, so you have several references outside of Scripture that affirm that he was dead. So, so this is what this does. Now let me just say this. Our faith has to be anchored in the Word of God. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. But it's helpful when people challenge our theology to be able to say, you can look outside of Scripture and you have multiple attestation that he really was dead. 
So at least we have to agree, for now, he was dead. Yes, he was dead. Okay, thank you. I rest my stand for now until I bring my next witnesses. All right, so he was dead. Let's go to the next slide. Christ died, and you can advance it again. He died for our sins. This is huge. There's a difference between believing in the historical death of Jesus and then believing in the redemptive death of Jesus. I don't just believe that He died. I believe that He died for me. Specifically, I believe that He died for my sins. This is huge. And so think about this. Uh, I remember as a child, we would go to church Christmas and Easter, and then there were a few years that we were kind of regular. Okay, I didn't grow up really Christian, uh, but, but I remember we'd go fairly often. And, and in those years that we were regular, you could ask me, did Jesus die? And I'd say, of course He died. I would even say He died for us. But, but in my mind, I wasn't realizing that, wait a minute, if Christ died for our sins, that means that I have sins personally. And if I have sins personally and someone had to die for them, that must mean that the wages of sin is death. And if someone had to die for my sins to satisfy God's claims, then therefore I must be accountable to God. There's all sorts of implications here. It's implied that God is a holy God and that death is the wages of sin, that I'm accountable to God, and that God in His grace allowed a substitute to die for me. He died for our sins. It's the substitutionary death of Jesus. And so growing up, and that was my understanding of Jesus, and I'll never forget because this is what changed my life, and this is when I came to life. Uh, in 1997, I was tree trim, and I worked for a company out of Kentucky, but we worked in Mobile, Alabama for 14 months. And, uh, and first of all, one Sunday, we went to Pensacola Beach, Florida, and I'm laying on the beach reading a Western novel, because I like Westerns, and someone hands me a gospel track. And I put it in the back of the book, and I, I read it that night, and I started thinking about it. And it was talking about how we're sinners, and, and we needed someone to pay our sin debt. A co-worker who was also unsaved invited me to church the next weekend. We went there in Mobile. And, and the, the pastor, the guy preaching, he was an evangelist traveling through, and he's preaching from Ephesians 2, and, and I'll never forget, he just gave an illustration to describe substitutionary death and for the first time ever, the lights came on. I realized, wait a minute, that's why He died. He didn't just die. He died for my sins. And He died for your sins as well. That's, that's the gospel message. And so His death is redemptive. He died for our sins. Next bullet point according to the Scriptures. And, and I love how Paul does this. You have, you have scriptural evidence, and then you have empirical evidence. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is a big deal, because someone could claim to die for your sins. How did you know if that's even effective? Anyone could say, hey, I'm going to die for your sins. How do I know that that's effective? Well, the Old Testament predicted that when Messiah comes, He would have His hands and His feet pierced, Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus. Isaiah, you know, uh, 8th century B.C., looking ahead to the coming of Jesus and predicting that He would be, you know, this, this born of a virgin Savior, that He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, the government would be upon His shoulders, Isaiah 9. Isaiah 11, that He would bring justice to the nations and restore precursed conditions. Isaiah 53 that he would be suffered, suffer under the hands ultimately of God when the Lord would lay upon him the iniquity of us all, that he would die as a sheep led to the slaughter, and he would die in our place. And so the scripture foretold the death of Jesus in Isaiah 53. And so he died according to the scriptures. Uh, he fits the pattern. He fits the expectation. He is the fulfiller, and so it validates the Christian message. But also you'll find next bullet point, he was buried, which is empirical evidence. Uh, Paul does this. He's got scriptural evidence, 
He died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried. That's empirical evidence. Later on, He's going to say, He rose again the third day according to the scripture, Scriptural evidence, and He was seen by all these witnesses, empirical evidence. And so, the fact that He was buried shows that they were convinced that He was dead. He truly did die, and He died for our sins. Well, let's go to the next bullet point, or the next slide here. He was raised the third day. <laughs> this is what makes it the good news. Our Savior didn't stay dead. A dead Savior can't save anyone. But Jesus rose again from the dead. And so, verse 4, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is incredible. And so, I want to talk about some of the witnesses to this. You can go to the first bullet point. Uh, it's foretold in the Scriptures. Now, there's... There, <laughs> I don't want to get into all this. I would love to, by the way. All right? It's just, you know, there's this thing called the clock that keeps moving. But, but you know, uh, some Old Testament scholars have claimed that the resurrection is not in the Old Testament. Uh, I think that can be thoroughly disproven. Okay? And, and I'll just say this. Uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16 looks ahead to the resurrection of Jesus according to Peter the Apostle. That, that being a prophet, David, when he said, you'll not leave my body in the grave to let me suffer corruption, he's not talking about himself. He looked ahead to the resurrection of Jesus. All right? You've got Psalm 16. You've got Psalm 22, which the events that take place that are recorded in Psalm 22, we can't really find anything in the life of David that match that. It could be uh, some things might begin to match it, but, but the things speak beyond David to David's greater son, the Lord Jesus. And when you read Psalm 22, it looks past the time when he is surrounded by his enemies. They cast lots for his garments. They pierce his hands and his feet. It looks past that to the other side of death where he declares God's name to the brethren. That he brings salvation to the nations. And so David as a prophet looks beyond the death of Messiah to the resurrection of Messiah and the gospel message impacting the very nations because of that. You have Isaiah 53. I've got to go here. Uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, I, does, does David ever preach longer second service? I'm so sorry. I'm kind of... But you know what? Uh, I'll just like stop it really short after a while. Uh, you feel a little more freedom whether it's legit or not. Isaiah 53. So, so you know, I referenced this earlier, but I'm actually going to read it this time. Isaiah chapter 53, for example, verse, uh, verse 9, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet with, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, etc. Verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. He would render himself as a guilt offering. And then yet you see on the other side, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper his hand. Uh, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Verse 12, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty or the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. It's looking beyond the death of this individual to what will come to him after that death. And so it's looking beyond the death of the servant of Yahweh, the Messiah, to the resurrection. And so that's why Paul can say he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, this is a huge deal because the resurrection was predicted. And, and you've got to think about this. The, the fact that Jesus said not only that He would rise again, but He said on the third day. So if He would have risen on the second day, the fourth day, the fifth day, it would have been astounding. It would have been unprecedented. It would have been never seen before, but it would not have validated His claim as Messiah. You know like the old stories of Babe Ruth where he would point where he's going to knock it out of the park? Jesus points and says, third day coming up. That's who I am. That was His validating sign. And so next bullet point. You see this validated by eyewitness account. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4, or excuse me, verse 5 says, He appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter. He appeared to the twelve. And actually, that's kind of shrinking it down here. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the, to the disciples with Thomas absent. He appeared again with Thomas present. And it wasn't just like a mystical spiritual resurrection. 
It was a bodily resurrection where Jesus could say, thrust your hand into my side. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I have. He was bodily resurrected. He conquered death. Absolutely amazing. And so validated by eyewitness accounts, and not just Peter, and not just the twelve, but Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, on the road to Damascus, to, to arrest Christians and have them bound, and and on his way there, the heavens split open. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus. He saw the resurrected Christ. And then, beyond that, Paul says, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. And, and it, as if to say, and if you don't believe me, go ask them. Paul says, many of them or most of them remain alive to this day. It's like he's saying, don't take my word for it. Go do an interview with them. And so, multiple witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Think about this. Think about how if you committed some crime and you tried to say, no, I wasn't there. And, and you had 12 people that saw you there. The court would drop the gavel in a heartbeat. And if the jury's not convinced by that and 500 people come in and they say, no, I saw they were there. Man, you would be ruled guilty. And my point is, you know, in a court of law, one of my best friends is a judge. He says that, that you're looking for this beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what you want, to, to drop the gavel. And, and so beyond a reasonable doubt, Jesus rose from the dead. You know Josh McDowell, the apologist? He was a lawyer. He was against Christianity and set out to disprove it. And in the process, by his, by his research and evidence and no doubt the work of the Spirit and the Word of God, he came to faith in Jesus. And he's been a witness to Christ since then. And so, validated by eyewitness account. Next bullet point. Validated by the resilience of the apostles. So, so think of this. Um, you, read, you read Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are arrested for preaching in Jesus the resurrection. And they tell the, the Sanhedrin, we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. They're threatened and told to stop. And they said, we can't stop. He's resurrected. We can't stop. In Acts chapter 5, all 12 of the apostles are arrested. And they are flogged. They take a cat of nine tails and they whip them like they did Jesus. And they say to stop speaking in this name. And they say, what do you think we should do? Obey God or you? And they leave there rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. These men were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead and they were the closest to Him. And that's why they were resilient in their witness. That's why, like Horton the Elephant, they would say, do what you must, but I'm not going to budge. I'm going to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now, here's something to think about. So we say this often. We'll say, okay, we know that Christianity is true because the disciples were willing to die for their faith. And someone will rightly say, well, aren't there other people who are willing to die for their faith that's not Christianity? Are Muslims willing to die for their faith? So how does that make Christianity true and somehow Islam is not true? What's the difference? I'm glad you asked. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is from uh, Gary Habermas. He's a resurrection scholar up at Liberty University. And he says this, Muslims tell us to follow Islam because only God could have written the Quran. And this is from one of their scriptures. If you doubt as to what we have revealed from time to time to our servant Muhammad, then produce a surah or a verse like thereunto. And basically what they're saying is, if you don't believe that this is true, let's see you write something like this. All right? Now, let me just make this clear as I possibly can. We'll use this argument for scripture because no one could have written this predicting in advance. Fulfilled prophecy does validate the authority and reliability of Scripture. But here's where I want to go with this. Muslims are willing to die for their faith, and by their own testimony, the foundation by which they're confident it's true, how could you write a book like this? Christians were willing and are willing to die for their faith, and Jesus set the bar way up here. Because when Jesus turned over the money changers' table at the temple, 
And he was asked, what sign do you give that you do these things? He was claiming to be Messiah because the zeal of God's house consumes him. He was acting it out and they caught the cue and they said, what sign do you give us that you're claiming to be Messiah is what they're saying. Here's what Jesus said. Destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. Think about this. In essence, Jesus is saying, if I don't resurrect, I'm not the Messiah. If I do resurrect, I am the Messiah. That's putting the bar to the heavens because who could possibly come alive from the dead unless they're the Messiah? And so Jesus, in essence, was saying, if I don't come out of the grave, don't you dare believe in me. The ones that were closest to him, who saw that he truly was dead and saw that he truly was alive, said, man, I'll do anything for him, even die, and I'll count it an honor. And so it's validated by the resurrection. You can go to the next slide. Validated by the resilience of the apostle. Now think about this. <laughs> the essential nature of the resurrection. Paul's trying to argue or to, to think through this logically with them because some of these super wise men were making them doubt the resurrection. And Paul says, okay, let's go down that road for a second. Let's think about the implications of this doctrine that you're toying with. If there is no resurrection, then dot, dot, dot. <laughs> So this is a funny story, uh, and it's, it, from what I understand, it's true. So I'm taking it as true. Uh, I, now, I did read about it on the Internet, which makes it suspicious, okay? Uh, but, but you can fact check me here. So you can go to the next slide here. Uh, this individual's name was Gregor McGregor. He was from Scotland, and in the 1820s, he came up with, you know, talk about a scam this is before they had emails that said, hey, I, wanna, I, wanna send you, I want you to send me some gift cards to pay your bill, okay, whatever the scam is. This is before they did that. Uh, he came up with this. He invented a country in Central America that he called Poyais. And, and he had it printed in newspapers and pamphlets, 8 million acres, prime real estate, you know, rich in resources, and you can have a share in it for this many dollars. And, and 270 people from Scotland left on two ships after they had emptied their coffers and given all their money to start a new life in a new land, and they get on their ships to go to a place that doesn't exist. Can you imagine? Can you imagine... I mean, all of us have faced a financial challenge before. Imagine giving up everything and you get to Central America and there's not even the country there that you thought was there. Gregor McGregor better know how to get out of Dodge. That's all I got to say. Um, but, you know, way, you know, exponentially worse than that. Uh, there's no comparison to believe in the resurrection from the dead to find out there is no resurrection from the dead. There's just no comparison. And so Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 12. He says, If Christ has preached that He's been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? If there's no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised. And if He's not been raised, our preaching is in vain. And not only that, your faith is in vain. Moreover, we're found to be false witnesses because we've said there is a resurrection, but if there is no resurrection, I guess we're not telling the truth. And so, unspeakable heartache if there is no resurrection. And so, Paul talks about what's riding on the resurrection. You can go to the next slide here. And the first bullet point there, the resurrection of Christ. If there is no resurrection, then Christ is not resurrected. You can't say that He's resurrected if there is no such thing as a resurrection. Verse 13 if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. In verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And so uh, that's writing on the resurrection. Second would be the value of the preached word. And you can advance it again. The value of the preached word. Verse 14, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Uh, there, there's, there's no use doing this if it's not true, right? And so, uh, Pastor David, he's not doing what he does every Sunday morning just because it's fun. I, I would be confident he finds fulfillment in his ministry, but he finds fulfillment specifically because he knows that he's preaching the truth and it impacts lives and it has eternal value. But if there is no resurrection, there's really no point in doing this. The next bullet point, 
the object of our faith. <laughs> Verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. In verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. If, if my salvation is anchored to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and He's not been resurrected, then I don't have salvation. I'm believing something that's hollow and empty and not true, and that means I still need a Savior because... There's no doubt that I'm still a sinner. And so Paul's just taking this to its logical end. Uh, and so the, if you believe something and it's not true, you're believing in vain. I'll tell you a story. It's a true story that, that's kind of hilarious here. And, and my point of sharing this is the object of our faith matters. It's not just that we're believing something. We're believing something that's true. If it's not true, then our faith is in vain. Uh, years ago, I guess probably about eight or ten years ago, we, uh, we went on a family vacation to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. Uh, anybody have daughters here that watch like the, uh, oh, what's some Felicity, all the American Girl doll movies? Okay, my girls watched all those. And Anyway, Colonial Williamsburg, they wanted to go there. And uh, April, that's my wife, her, her sister and her husband, their kids came. April's parents came. So it's just, just a good time with the family. And uh, we, were, we were at the counter to check into the hotel. And this guy next to us, he starts arguing with the clerk. And, and I'm noticing like he's raising his voice. He's getting angry. And finally he says, no, I have a reservation. And she said, I know you have a reservation, sir. You have a reservation for next Tuesday, not this Tuesday. And he had literally driven like hours to come to Colonial Williamsburg to check into his hotel. And he was a week off. All right. Now, my point in that is, probably not the best illustration, but it kind of works, is that I might be convinced that this is true, but if it's not true, I'm believing in vain. And he was convinced that he has a room for today. It didn't do him any good because he did not have a room for today. We are trusting that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead as guarantee that our sins have been paid for. But if there is no resurrection, then the object of our faith is in vain. We, we, a dead Savior can't save anyone. Next bullet point. You can advance one more. Uh, the, re, the reliability of the apostles. Paul says, verse 15, if there is no resurrection, then we are found to be false witnesses because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if there is no resurrection. I love how logical he is. <laughs> it's like, you know, then, then if there's no resurrection, we're telling you a false gospel, so don't be trusting in us. Next bullet point is the removal of our sin. And this is huge. Verse 17, Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless or vain. You are still in your sins. Now, uh, this is something that we don't think about a lot. We, we, we believe the gospel message, death, burial, and resurrection. It's crystallized right here in these verses. Um, but maybe, maybe we've not thought about the significance of the resurrection in this sense. We all know that because Christ resurrected, we'll be resurrected. And so, we've, you know, death has been conquered. But the resurrection also shows us that our sin debt has been paid for. Now, the penalty of sin was death. But if Jesus stays dead, how do I know that it's been paid fully? In other words, if He stays dead, is He still paying? Still paying? Still paying? The fact that He is released from the dead shows that He finished paying and He's conquered death. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. It says He was raised for our justification. The resurrection shows that His payment was accepted. It's the receipt that our sin debt has been paid in full. And of course, that God raised Him from the dead so that we can have new life in Him. And so the removal of our sin is connected to the resurrection of Jesus. Well, let's go to the next bullet here. Also, those who have already died. <laughs> he says in verse 18, if there is no resurrection, then what about those who have fallen asleep in Christ? They've perished. Um, uh, all, all these people that have died trusting in Jesus, if there's no resurrection, then I guess there's no real hope for them. Again, he's taking it to its logical end. How many, how many um, over the years, how many families have been encouraged knowing that when their loved one dies... They died trusting in a Christ who conquered the dead. 
And so knowing that even though they have passed on, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And someday when Christ returns, resurrected bodies glorified in the presence of Jesus. Well, let's go on to the next bullet point, meaningful existence. Paul says, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul says this. He says, if there's no resurrection, and if this world is all there is, you guys should feel sorry for the apostles because they're taking a lot of flack for something that's not even true if Christ did not resurrect from the dead. Well, let's go to the other side of this. What's secured by the resurrection? What's secured by the resurrection? And so if you'll go with me to verses 3 and 4 again, and this is the first bullet point, the payment of our sins and the satisfaction of God. This is the beauty of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins he was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. So the payment of our sins, the satisfaction of God. Next bullet point. The resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection of believers. <laughs> it's really shrunk down in John 11, but I, I'm staying away from John 11 because Pastor David's getting there, all right? That's why we're resurrecting from 1 Corinthians and not there. But, but you know, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead... He lives. Already, those of us who have trusted in Jesus, we have eternal life right now. And Paul connects our resurrection in the future to Him. Verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead. So, so stop doubting the resurrection. Paul says He has been raised from the dead. And He is the first fruits of those who sleep. And the concept is, just as an Israelite would bring the first fruits of the harvest and give it as a gift to God, it was a declaration of more that will follow. Christ is the first to be risen from the dead, never to die again. And, and that's a proof and a guarantee that we too will be raised from the dead. And so this changes everything for us. And then the final bullet point here is that the resurrection ultimately restores God's kingdom on the earth. Uh, th this, think about this. In Genesis 1 and 2, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and rule over it. And God put Adam and Eve ruling over God's creation, and, and He wanted them to fill the earth with that. And so, in essence, God wanted a world filled with people who worship Him, exercising His authority over the earth, and He said it's very good. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes in and, and now the fall of mankind and there's a counter kingdom on the earth. Instead of filling the world with people who worship God, you have Satan's counter kingdom pervading and filling the earth. And, and God's plan is that the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent, but he would suffer a mortal wound in the process. And fast forward all the way to the death of Jesus where Jesus dies according to the Scripture. But He rose again the third day and when He comes back, Revelation 19 and 20, He takes the serpent and He's judged first into the pit and into the lake of fire. And the serpent is destroyed and then there's this new heaven and new earth with human beings ruling and reigning with Christ again. I know that I just fast forward a lot of history, but the point is, is that the resurrection of Jesus is tied to everything God's going to do in the future as well. And so it restores God's kingdom on earth. Now, here's where we're in. One last slide here. What does that mean to us? And, you know, you've got this text in verse 58 that I'll read again. I want to just make a couple of comments about this. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work or your labor or your toil is not in vain in the Lord. When I am convinced that because Jesus resurrected, I will be resurrected too, there's nothing that I have to fear any longer. I'll never forget this as a child, just processing this and thinking, you know, death was the biggest fear that I had. And then when I came to faith in Jesus, realizing that, that the thing that I feared the most has already been conquered, there's nothing more to fear. And what that does is it sets us free to live boldly for Christ, even in the face of personal harm and danger, 
knowing, and of course we don't put ourselves in danger on purpose, but if I'm finding myself in danger for the sake of Christ, even if I die for the sake of Christ, my labor in the Lord is not in vain because there's a resurrection. And I'm preaching a resurrected Lord Jesus. Paul wanted the Corinthians to be steadfast and immovable. To be like Horton the Elephant that says, I'm not going to move from this foundation. And my encouragement to us this morning then is to, as we contemplate the resurrection to be steadfast in our faith and then to be steadfast also in our faithfulness, knowing that we are serving a risen Lord and everything we do for His name is not in vain. God, thank You so much for the privilege of opening the text of 1 Corinthians. And Lord, honestly, just to be encouraged by the, by the reality of the resurrection, I pray that we would serve You without fear and we'd serve You with great confidence knowing that our labor is not in vain. We thank you for the privilege and we thank you for the truth of a resurrected Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.